They were so physically in tune that everybody assumed they had to be in love. All they'd ever admit to, though, was a telepathic understanding and a deep affection for each other. The one indisputable fact was that as world, European and ultimately Olympic champions, Torval and Dean were the supreme ice dance combination as competing amateurs, and they are to this day leading their own professional dance troupe. Each time we do something, I don't think it is like, wow. But what we've tried, well, hopefully it's wow, but what we've tried to do is go in different directions. What we've tried to be is versatile. You know, if you're doing a piece that is, is a very sort of expressive piece, you have to believe in it and act the part, whatever you're playing. So the costume and the way you act and the way you feel about it inside it as you're doing it all has to sort of come together as well as being able to skate at the same time. What we've tried to do is have a control over our body and what we've tried to do is absorb as much um, dance, art, um, impressions lots around us. Lots of information. Us. Just <laughs> lots of information. And, uh, that's our way of expressing it, is on the ice. A writer, its words, a painter, its pictures, and for us, what we want to say or do comes out of our skating. His father was a miner, hers a factory worker, both in Nottingham. After a series of ice dancing and ice skating partners, their association began as teenagers and continued as she became an insurance clerk and he a policeman. The first time we actually skated together I think it was something like six o'clock in the morning in a cold dark ugly ice rink that it wasn't inspiring at all and when we first started the bells didn't ring or anything like that it was just very methodical just sort of taking the other person's hand and holding them and it was all very a bit polite very <laughs> polite and awkward but um, you know after time that things get easier and we get into a working routine and uh, really it was just a progression we gave up our jobs before we had any kind of sponsorship and we relied on our savings. And obviously our parents would have helped us a little bit. But fortunately, in the year of between 1881, our city council decided to come through with a sponsorship. What made it even better was the fact that we, we not only got a bronze, we got a gold medal the next year. We, we were expecting, you know, the most to maybe get a bronze medal. They danced to anything, pushing to the limits, the traditional rules and constraints of ice dancing. And their devil-may-care but skillfully planned programs took them to a first world title. We didn't know what to do with ourselves, did we? Because we already planned to continue until 1984, and we thought there might be some kind of gradual progression. And Having got a gold medal in 81, there was only one way we were going to go from there. <laughs> so uh, we knew we had um, our work cut out. And I think that's really what pushed us to, to maintain um, what we were doing, uh, of trying to be different, trying to go in different areas, because we'd already achieved the medal, and we didn't want to remain static. We wanted to experiment going other directions. And as we were now the Vogue setters, it was our sort of responsibility, I think, and, and that really challenged us. We had no one else to look up to, so we had to go off in different directions and really push ourselves to the limits. And practice ultimately did make them perfect. At the World Championships in 1983, all the judges gave them maximum points, bodies and minds in perfect harmony. I think our characters work well. Um, the way that we are is that possibly I'm the more aggressive and, and fiery type, and, and Janie's, <laughs> she's nodding away there, um, a lot more placid. And, and in that regard, um, I think I bring the energy to it, but Jane brings the, the steadiness. She's like the rock that keeps us firm and doesn't let things get out of proportion. And so those two qualities together, I think, have got us through the period. Christopher Dean was the one policeman that Jane Torville couldn't walk past in the mid-70s. And their combination of theater, dance, and music was sufficiently arresting even to win over the admiration of those hardened critics who refused to accept ice dancing as legitimate sport. The levels of fitness and balletic suppleness could only be marveled at. Chris puts more energy into things, and I tend to calm things down. So between the two of us, we, we usually achieve a happy medium. I'm probably not more competitive, because if if I realize I can't do something, I'm happy to stand back. 
and work at it sort of quietly and slowly, whereas Chris would rather get it happening straight away. I enjoy the thrills, the experience, whether it's driving a motor car fast or being driven by somebody or going down a bobsled run, which was a, an amazing experience. If you have the opportunities, I believe you go and take them, and that's what I like to do. Bungee jumping is the next one. Chris injects sort of more um, pace into everything we do, and so sometimes he's, he's over-enthusiastic um, between the two of us. And, and also, with, when you have a partner, you have that responsibility to the other person. I think that, that helps you get out of bed at six in the morning. <laughs> And yet, strangely, it's for a magnificently choreographed crash on ice to an almost perfect choice of music that Torval and Dean will be immortalized forever. In competitive skating, we were always looking for that piece of music that was original, but at the same time, yeah. easily... Identifiable with, you know, people and something you could... If it was a piece that was original, you could easily sort of sway to it or keep the rhythm of it or something. had to catch the person that was listening to it yeah. almost immediately. But at the same time, it had to be a piece of music that we're going to be comfortable with for about mm -hmm. nine or mm -hmm. ten months yeah. because yeah. we're going to be working with it day in, day out, and it has to sustain that length of time. I think we were sort of one of the first people that took a theme. And then finally, in the Olympic year, we were looking for that piece of music that we'll, people would go, why hadn't I thought of that? Why didn't you use that? And we knew in the rule books that you can only change the music, the rhythm change. You can only have a maximum of three changes. But we said, well, what's the minimum amount of changes? And there wasn't there was any. There was no rule about it, so we came up with Bolero. It's so identifiable and, and recognizable with, with our skating that as long as we're skating together, we won't get away not performing it. <laughs> One purchase of Bolero by Christopher Dean launched a worldwide bestseller. 400,000 copies sold on the back of the couple's finest hour. Business in the House of Commons was halted to announce to wild cheering the news of British Olympic gold. The special moment was actually when they put the medal around your neck. I think for me, it was just the same that when you actually get the medal and that's it, you've achieved it. For us, it was, we really hadn't planned that much after winning the gold medal at Olympics. You know, we were just getting to that point. And so we didn't know what was beyond that. And in one way, it was a great high and it was sort of euphoric and special and, and wonderful. But the other side of it, there was this um, void of not knowing what it was the end of what we'd, all, we'd known. It's because you, you have such a build-up to it. I mean, you can't say it was a four-year build-up. I mean, it was sort of a long-term plan. But certainly within that last year of working towards the Olympics, it was, everything was geared to it. And it was very hard to get ourselves back into training to compete in the World Championships, which took place after the Olympics in 84. But they were perfect again and a fourth world title was theirs with huge financial rewards guaranteed the moment they decided to turn professional. The biggest challenge lay ahead though. How could they make such artistry without the element of competition appealing to the public? And performing night after night in a show and doing lots of routines, sort of eight routines a night, whatever, we realized how much in shape we needed to be and how much more work it was preparing too. We spent much more hours on the ice than we did as amateurs. It wasn't a shock, I guess we enjoyed it, but it's now when we look back, we realize the difference and how much harder we have to work now. But the competitive instinct, so natural to both, has proved impossible to resist. Reinstated in the Olympic movement, Lillehammer in 94 represents their greatest challenge yet. With both in their mid-30s now, youth is no longer on their side. Head up now, reach. As Chris and I have gotten older, you're very aware of your body and how important it is to you. And uh, things you could probably get away with when you were younger, you realize that, that the body is, you know, it's what your work's about and you need to keep in good shape. And um, you have to have a lot of respect for the body so that it works. Lengthen your right side more, that's better. 
They have performed across the world in front of Nancy Reagan in Washington and Raisa Gorbachev in Moscow, selling, in their own words, an ice dance product that still contains a large element of romance, but now has a much harder edge, including comedy and, on occasion, some brutality. They have more than survived leaving the sport, but it's arguable whether the sport has altogether survived their departure. They made their mark. They were Olympic champions. And um, they will always go down, as far as I'm concerned, in history books, as probably two of the greatest skaters that ever lived. Ice skating didn't say it wanted a revolution, but with Torval and Dean, it certainly got one. And the mini-revolution in the Olympic movement means that, assuming they qualify, of course, in the British Championships, the greatest combination in the sport's history will once again be appearing on the ultimate world stage.